The truth is that the biggest football smart arse is Messi. He covers his mouth to protect himself from lip readers when he is provoking defenders. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of Books FC, the show that respects football to the word, paragraph, and the letter. I'm Bruce, and today I'm going to talk to you about Lionel Messi and why he's been called the biggest hypocrite in the football world by Dudek and Mourinho. I'm also going to tell you about what was going on behind the scenes when Mourinho was the coach at Casablanca during the greatest period of Clásicos in football history. The ones at the start of the 2010s, Guardiola's Barca up against Mourinho's Real. Dudek was Iker Casillas' understudy at Real Madrid, and he tells of these stories about the Merengue Club in his autobiography, A Big Pole in Our Goal, published by Trinity Mirror Sport Media, now Reach Sport. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's dive right in. El Clasico is different from any other game in world football, and I was at Real Madrid during a period when Pep Guardiola's Barcelona were enjoying a golden age. The games between Real and Barca were real battles. International teammates put friendships aside during those matches, and you would see sly tactics in operation, such as Guardiola getting his players to surround the referee after almost every foul. Pressurizing match officials is a big part of Barcelona's identity as tiki-taka. Mourinho knew that everyone thought Ronaldo was arrogant, so he tried to turn more attention onto our biggest playing rival, Lionel Messi. The truth is that the biggest football smart arse is Messi. He covers his mouth to protect himself from lip readers when he is provoking defenders. He irritates opponents, even if he doesn't show emotions on the pitch. He was right. Messi said things to Pepe and Sergio Ramos that were offensive, in contrast to his golden boy image in the media. If I told you what he'd said, you'd probably wouldn't believe it came from a player who is a role model for many people in the world. Mourinho used Messi to convince us that every great player must have an ego and a bit of menace about them, no matter what their image, to go with their will to win. Messi was part of a provocative Barcelona team that would do things out of sight of the referee in the hope that there was a reaction which he spotted. They also knew how to fall down at the right time in the penalty area. Small details like that made a difference to Barcelona winning big games and Mourinho wanted to open people's eyes to it. Real played Barcelona five times during 2010-11, my last season in Madrid, including four games, La Liga, Copa del Rey final, and Champions League semifinals, within 18 days in April and May. Earlier that season, we had lost 5-0 at Camp Nou. We had started the season well, and Mourinho decided to go there with an attack-minded strategy, but they were too aggressive, too fast, and too dynamic for us. We were shocked to lose 5-0. Mourinho walked into the dressing room and slammed the door. Be quiet and listen. Listen to them singing in the dressing room next door. They won 5-0, but what did they get for it? Three points. Nothing else. Remember this before we play them next time. Then he surprised us. Tomorrow, take a day off training, but you still have to work. Go into town. Take your wives and children out. Go to your favorite places. Let the people see you. Talk to them about losing 5-0. Nobody will say a bad word. They will support you. It will get it out of your system. Our opponent was better. Tell them, but we will be ready next time. Other coaches would have been full of anger, rage, and recrimination. Not Mourinho. It hurt his reputation to lose 5-0, but he refused to let it create internal divisions in the dressing room. The greatness of Mourinho was visible in that moment. He showed his great experience in how he could raise players' spirits in difficult moments through smart psychology. He then started to pin newspaper quotes on the wall in our training complex, like Phil Thompson did at Liverpool, before we played Barca with headlines like Xavi, beating Real is like having an orgasm, and a photo of Gerard Piquet holding five fingers up celebrating his 5-0 win. It worked to a certain extent as later that season, days after drawing 1-1 in the return league game in the Bernabeu, we beat them 1-0 in the Copa del Rey final. They went on to win La Liga and knocked us out of the Champions League, but that cup final defeat prevented Barcelona's greatest ever side from winning the treble. After much speculation, Cristiano Ronaldo signed for Real Madrid from Manchester United in the summer of 2009. You've probably read a lot about him, but he is one of the most professional players you could ever meet. If training was due to start at 11 a.m., he'd be there for 9.15 a.m. He did extra work in the gym before and after our 90-minute training sessions. I watched him for almost two years and I can say that everything he achieved on the pitch is through his own hard work. 
He also symbolizes the modern football superstar. Not many others have their own brand like CR7 and very quickly became the number one name at Real. Cristiano is ambitious. He wants to be the star. If he doesn't receive a pass when he thinks he should, he sulks. This sometimes pissed the lads off, but we got used to it. His personality and character is similar to Raul's. Raul wasn't always happy when we won 3-0 and he didn't score. He preferred a modest 2-1 win with him on the score sheet. He adored scoring the winning goal, being the hero, and Cristiano is the same. He wants to be the goal scorer at all costs and has an egotistical mentality about it. I think he sees teammates as assistants who are working towards his greatness and this irritated Mourinho. Mourinho worked with him a lot. He knew his compatriot cared more about his own success than that of the team, but wouldn't accept it. He explicitly warned him against provoking supporters and teammates with his gestures and reactions on the pitch and told him he must become more of a team player. Mourinho was keen to avoid Ronaldo thinking that if Real Madrid won, it was because of himself, and if we didn't, it was because of the rest of us, but that took a long time to happen. Ahead of one game against Barcelona, his instruction to the front three was not to press the Barca players in their own half, but to draw them forward to try to hit them on the counter-attack. Ronaldo ignored him. Right from the kickoff, he chased the ball from right back to center back to left back in their half, was unable to win it, and then turned around to the other lads and gestured, why aren't you backing me up? The crowd booed, thinking the others weren't putting any effort in. Afterwards, Mourinho asked him in the dressing room why he had ignored him. Cristiano was the type of guy who was not afraid of exchanging words, and he and Mourinho then had a frank, aggression-free discussion in front of the rest of us about their differing tactical views. Several of the other lads had their say, and I sat there thinking if they'd had the discussion six months earlier, then maybe the team would have gelled quicker and we would have won La Liga, and perhaps the Champions League, rather than Barcelona. I regularly stayed late after training so Cristiano could practice his famous free kicks. Obviously, he had to get good at them to score past me. He can make a ball move at a different trajectory than any other player, and this is always put down to the way he connects with it. But there is another reason. Ronaldo has small feet. I have faced a couple of other players who can hit a ball like him, but with less power, and they had small feet too. Cristiano takes a UK size 7 boot, and I think having smaller feet allows him to control the power in his legs better than others. He effectively crushes a ball when he strikes it, so it flies off like a balloon that is losing its air. Trying to stop a ball that moves in different directions at such a pace is incredibly difficult. I came to realize that in training. I also have to say that Cristiano is a perfect role model off the pitch for young players, but he is very image conscious. He got his hair cut every couple of days and would spend a lot of time in front of the mirror in the dressing room to ensure he looked his best before TV interviews and matches. He would join in the banter with the other lads in the dressing room, but he didn't take losing very well. We lost to Lyon in the Champions League, and I had invited the boxing champion, Darius Michelsevsky, to the game as my guest. He came to watch us train the next day and was shocked when he saw Cristiano arrive and refused to sign autographs for some kids. I'm going to fuck smash him, said Derek. Fuck getting a picture with him and his autograph. How can he be like that with kids? I calmed him down and spoke to Cristiano. I'm not here for autographs, he said angrily. I'm here to win. We went out of the Champions League to Lyon last night. I'm pissed off. Leave me alone. The kids were especially disappointed with him, and it came across like he was being a prima donna. But Ronaldo is a perfectionist who takes defeats personally. Thankfully, Derek didn't get to him. Ronaldo might never have won a golden boot after a knockout blow from him. As the title race intensified, we drew 1-1 with Barcelona at Bernabeu in April 2011. Mourinho entered the dressing room and said it wasn't a bad result because we'd played most of the second half with 10 men after Raul Albiol was sent off. But then he surprised us. I see your relations with the media are quite good. I know we have to get along with them, but I didn't think you were getting along that well. I heard from them that you do not want meetings before the games, that we practice set pieces the wrong way, and our tactical training sessions are not good enough. I turn on my TV four hours before the game and what the f do I see? That a journo is giving away our lineup. How could we ever surprise them if one of you is a rat? Yes, yes, a rat. Somebody released the starting 11 before the game. They knew everything about us. 
We trained all week. We wanted to surprise them. He continued to shout about how Barcelona knew of his plan to play Pepe in midfield to manmark Lionel Messi. I'm always on the front line. I control what happens at this club. I lead you into battle like a general. But as we're about to attack, one of you stabs me in the back. You stab me in the back before such an important game? His eyes started to mist up. I'd never seen him in such an emotional state before. Where is the rat? Who is it? Who could it be? Maybe you. He pointed a finger at Esteban Granero, a midfielder who was from Madrid. He then pointed at three or four senior players. Maybe it is somebody who has played here the longest. How can you destroy what we've been working for all week? You screwed me over, but you screwed yourselves and your families and friends too. I will get to the source. With that, he launched a plastic bottle against the dressing room wall, stormed out and slammed the door. We sat in silence in the dressing room like beaten dogs. Mourinho was resentful toward us for a couple of days. Silvino, Mourinho's goalkeeping coach, told me that it had left a scar on Jose's soul and he even considered quitting Real Madrid. The media started to speculate that he'd lost the dressing room, that he'd fallen out with Cristiano Ronaldo, and that he privately suspected Iker of being the rat because his girlfriend, now wife, was TV journalist Sara Carabanero, and she must have inside stories from the dressing room. I never found out who leaked the team that day, but it was the start of problems between Mourinho and Casillas. After I'd left Real, I returned to watch the first leg of the 2012 Copa del Rey semifinal as part of a Polish FA delegation and bumped into Mourinho in a hotel at lunchtime. I asked him how things were going and he said, we have a problem with one girl, but we'll handle it. It was easy to work out he was referring to Casillas' missus, who was sharing all kinds of juicy anecdotes from the Real dressing room on TV. And he dealt with it by signing Diego Lopez from Sevilla when Iker suffered a hand injury. When Iker returned to fitness, Lopez remained in goal. And that brings our story to a close. There you have it. You now know more about what was going on in Mourinho's Real Madrid, Messi's attitude to the atmosphere during the Clasicos, the mole in the Real Madrid locker room that drove Jose Mourinho crazy. I hope you enjoyed this excerpt. It's taken from Jersey Dudek's autobiography, A Big Pole in Our Goal, published by Trinity Mirror Sport Media, now Reach Sport. Now, I want to hear your opinions. Do you like La Pulga's personality? Do you think like Dudek and Mourinho that he's a hypocrite who isn't the same person behind the scenes? Please share your opinions. I can't wait to read them. See you very soon for another episode of Books FC.